Well, good morning, Discovery Fellowship. Welcome to the church gathered. Welcome to the church scattered, watching online via live stream this morning. However you're joining us, we're grateful that you are. We're going to prepare to lift our voices in praise to the Lord. If you would like to stand to sing, you're welcome. You can stay seated to sing. If you'd like, whatever suits your fancy this morning. So let's prepare to lift our voices to the Lord. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather safely. We thank you, Lord, that you are healing your people, you are healing your nation. And uh, we are gathered this morning, Father, to give you our praises for all that you've done. You have made a way for us uh, into the holy place through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're so grateful for the way. And so we want to sing about that this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and join us as we continue? Good morning, church. Here and on the live stream. I moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Come on. Waymaker. Waymaker. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way made, miracle work, promise key. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lights around. I worship. You are here, even every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker. Miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you work and never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop. You are waymaker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Amen. Great singing. Have a seat. pleasant good morning to you wherever you may be. Thank you so much for being a part of Discovery Fellowship Church. Now is a great time to pull out your mobile device, open up the Church Center app, and check in to let us know you're here. While you have that app open, you can look around at all the other things going on at Discovery, including the upcoming Seder Passover celebration that will be happening on March 28th. As of the recording of this video, there are only two tables left, so if you want one of those, I would do it right now. Go ahead, I'll wait. They're gone, just like that, you guys. It was that quick. Hey, also, while you're looking around at the app or our website, dfchurch.com, um, 
If you're interested in serving or volunteering or being plugged in in some way or another, head to dfchurch.com slash volunteer, fill out that form, and we'll get back to you and get you plugged in. With all the people beginning to come back to in-person services, the activities that are going on, high school and middle school, Sunday school starting up again today, we could use more volunteers in several areas. And so maybe that's you. Let us know where your heart's desires are, uh, what giftings you think God is giving to you, and we will plug you in. Hey, another area where we could use your help this year is our Vacation Bible School program. It's coming up this summer, the first week of June, the 7th through 11th, and we could use your help. We're gonna be limiting registrations based upon how many volunteers we have. And so if you wanna be a part of sharing the gospel with potentially hundreds of kids from our community, head to dfchurch.com, go to our events page and find the event Vacation Bible School Volunteers. You can register there, get all the details. Even if you aren't 100% certain, but you think you wanna do it, go ahead and fill that out now because we're right in the midst of planning this incredible outreach opportunity. Of course, this year it's just going to be open for our elementary age students, unless you're a volunteer and then we'll have childcare for your birth through preschool aged kids. Thanks again for being a part of Discovery Fellowship Church. If you have any questions or need anything, feel free to reach out to us. For now, why don't we stand back up as we continue to worship our Savior through song. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I worship Your
We were just testing you to see if you knew the words. <laughs> and you passed the test. Good job. Even Lamborghinis don't work right all the time. Right, doctor? <laughs> we'll get it figured out. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, we have some folks who are joining us this morning, not only online, but also over in our overflow room. So welcome to each one of you. Appreciate however you're here this morning. We are going to be finishing up a series of studies through the book of Colossians this morning. We've come to the very end of it. And so let me uh, pray and we'll just give ourselves to studying it for a few minutes. Lord, thank you for the time to commit to that. We ask that you'd help us with our technology, with all of the things that we are trying to juggle and learn and that it would uh, work well throughout the remainder of this service this morning. We're thankful for the time to give our thinking to yours and ask that you'd instruct us as we look at your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a look at this video clip if it works. Alcoa presents Fantastic Finishes. 1967. Johnny Unitas and the Baltimore Colts trail Green Bay 10 to nothing with just 51 seconds left. First, Unitas arches a perfect pass to Jimmy Orr. Then a successful onside kick. And here come the Colts again. Unitas fires a strike to Willie Richardson. A 13 to 10 victory delivered by Johnny U. Amazing. Down 10 to nothing with 51 seconds to go, and they come back to win the game. My apologies to any cheeseheads in here, and uh, to Frank Nelson in particular, um, but great finishes are fun, right? Great finishes are exciting, great finishes are important, and what happens in the final minutes, um, even the final seconds, obviously, of the game can make all the difference. Now, as I said, we have been worshiping God in recent weeks through the book of Colossians, and we've seen that this book is all about the greatest person in the universe. Uh, and we've been re reminded again why he is so supreme over everything and central to everything. We've been taught by the Holy Spirit that to maintain spiritual stability and to flourish in spiritual growth in the middle of a thoroughly confused world, these are the big ideas that we need to embrace. Embrace the supremacy of Christ over all things and express his supremacy and centrality in our daily living. So, now as the Apostle Paul wraps up this book, we should expect a big finish, right? So, let's check it out right from where we left off 
last week. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. He writes, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, See that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Okay, now on the one hand... uh, That seems to be an interesting enough personal way to sort of finish off a book or a letter, lots of names, people from the Colossian church, folks that uh, he knew, some, some greetings are there, some instructions are there. But on the other hand, when we read a section of scripture like that today, I suspect a lot of us would probably be inclined to sort of ask ourselves, what in the world am I supposed to get from a set of names and a list of personal instructions? Why in the world would the Holy Spirit of God preserve these 12 verses as divine revelation for his church for some 2,000 years? Well, here's why. It's because what God does in the lives of people He largely does through real-life, Christ-centered individuals. Or, I could say that another way, when, when God wants to accomplish change, and He wants to accomplish transformation in the lives of people, He doesn't merely... Uh, send us a book in the mail with a set of uh, DIY instructions and a command on the front saying, now y'all be sure to read this. No, he has, and he does, send us the truth, but he often mediates or ministers that truth through people. And it's people who make truth happen in our lives. It's people who demonstrate how God is out to transform us. So, this morning, let me just highlight three of the here's how God gets it done sort of lessons that we find in these verses. First of all, notice that the power of life-shaping encouragement can happen through you. Again, verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He's a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. Now notice what's happening. Paul decides to send a man named Tychicus to the city of Colossae. Not necessarily a household name to you and I, but To the Apostle Paul and to the Lord, uh, he was an outstanding, reference verse 7, a a beloved brother, a faithful servant, and a fellow bondservant in the Lord. In fact, in the New Testament scriptures, we see him in a couple of different places. We won't take the time to turn there, but in the book of Acts chapter 20, uh, Tychicus travels with Paul in ministry, helping to raise funds to help support and feed the starving believers back in Judea. In the book of Titus chapter 3, uh, Tychicus is sent to the island of Crete to there encourage Titus in the difficult work that he was doing with a difficult church. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Tychicus is sent, once again, this time to Ephesus as the apostle Paul 
uh, writes his last letter before he is executed by the Emperor Nero. Tychicus goes to strengthen Timothy and the other believers there in that crucial city. So, as Paul finishes up his letter here to the Colossians, he knows that beyond all of the sound doctrine and the right ideas that he has already written to this church in this book, what they also need is a personal touch from someone who has paid the price in their living for Jesus Christ. Someone who has seen Christians in all kinds of situations, and he is there to help lift up some discouraged heads. Since he's under house arrest, Paul is, Paul can't go, but Tychicus can. And Paul says that he wants that to happen specifically so that he may encourage your hearts. If you look up the word encouragement uh, using a concordance or a Bible dictionary, the verb there in verse 8, you'll find it's the Greek word or verb parakaleo. And it can literally mean to, to uh, put courage into. It can mean to come alongside and help. It can mean to provide comfort in the midst of difficult circumstances. Uh, and it can mean to lift the inner man or inner woman with refreshment. In fact, that word for encouragement, that very word when it's used as a noun in Scripture, as it is in John chapter 14, verse 16, it is also a personal name for the Holy Spirit. The paraclete, encouragement. We long for it. It nourishes our souls when we get it, right? I read a church uh, growth survey a couple of years ago that sort of reaffirms that when new people come to a church or join online, perhaps, um, over 90% say that they come in large part because they are looking for encouragement. One of my favorite authors, uh, the Christian counselor, uh, Dr. Larry Crabb, recalls an incident uh, in the church that he attended as he was a young man. It was customary in this church that the young men who would help with the distribution of the communion elements were encouraged oftentimes by the pastor to uh, pray out loud. And so feeling the pressure of public expectation, Larry uh, who back as a young man had a problem with stuttering, was called upon to stand in the church service and to pray. And in a terribly confused prayer, he recalls, quote, thanking the Father for hanging on the cross and praising Jesus for triumphantly bringing the Holy Spirit up from the grave. And when he had finished butchering that prayer, he vowed to himself that he would never again speak or pray out loud in front of a group. At the end of that service, uh, not wanting to meet any of the church elders who might feel personally constrained to correct his theology, Larry made a quick beeline for the exit door. However, before he could get out, one of the elders named Jim Dunbar caught him and having prepared himself for the dreaded and anticipated correction, instead, he found himself listening to these words. Larry, there's one thing I want you to know. You have passion, son. Whatever you do for the Lord, I am behind you 1,000%. Larry Crabb reflects in his book, appropriately enough entitled, Encouragement, quote, even as I recall these words, my eyes fill with tears. Those words were life words to me. They had power. They reached deep into my being. So, how does God meet that core life-shaping need that we all of us have in varying degrees for encouragement? He often uses others, right? I love this story. I've shared it before, but it's too good not to repeat. Uh, a pastor named Bill White wrote this. Two days ago, I was kneeling in silent prayer in the front room of our house at 6.30 in the morning. I just confessed my sins and was asking God for a blessing that day, desperately needing to feel loved by him in spite of my failures. My little boy, Timothy, who is 22 months old, had just gotten up. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye that he had sneaked quietly into the front room. 
He's always quiet in the morning when I'm praying because his mama instructs him to be. But this particular morning, he toddled straight over to me, put a hand on my folded hands, and softly repeated, Hi, special one. Hi, special one. Hi, special one. Never once had he ever called me that before. And yet now, six times he called me special one. He said it enough times for me to actually get it, that God was speaking to me and giving me a blessing. The power of life-shaping encouragement. Here's a second lesson from this portion of Scripture. The endowment of life-stabilizing confidence can, can happen through you and I. Again, verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Those are sister cities. So, you know, if you're kind of looking for a, uh, a quiet hero in your Christian life, the kind of person who's really not all that flashy or, or up front, but solid in the fullest sense of the word, then you should get to know Epaphras. We meet him here in Colossians chapter 4, and then once again in Philippians 2. So listen to what Paul says about him there. Paul writes, but I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Epaphras was his nickname, like Rick for Richard or Bill for William. My brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Now, when you read that and you read Paul's words back in Colossians 4, you realize that that he really understood what, it was, what was important when, when it came to other believers. Two things in particular from uh, Colossians 4.12. He says that you may stand perfect. That's uh, the Greek word teleos. It means complete or mature, fully assured in all the will of God. In other words, spiritual maturity and confidence in God's word and in God's will. And number two, from Philippians 2, Paul understood that God gets things done through the serious work and prayer of, of Christ-centered persons. Back in Colossians 4, he says that Epaphras was always laboring earnestly. It's the Greek word agonizo, a word for athletic contests or wrestling matches, a, you know, a struggle with competing forces. I wonder, how would you describe or maybe picture, a spiritual hero who sort of comes to your mind. A while back, um, Kevin Miller, one of the editors of uh, Christianity Today magazine, recalls a lesson that he learned about servant leadership from his father. Listen to what he writes. He said, Dad and I paddled through uh, padded through the, the tall trees, our, our feet quiet on the carpet of brown pine needles. We had come to New Hampshire to fish together, just the two of us, something that had never happened before. I knew then that I, now a full 11 years old, was becoming a real man. We placed our net, our tackle boxes, and rods in the canoe, then it slipped, slipped it quietly into the Ossipee River. As Dad paddled from the back, I cast my trustworthy MEPS fishing lure near the lily pads. Father, son, canoe, water, fish, pines. This was boyhood heaven. I desperately wanted to show my dad that I was worthy of the confidence that he'd placed in me by inviting me on this manly trip. However, two nights later, I awoke in our cabin painfully sick to my stomach. I feared I might throw up. 
I needed to get to the bathroom now. But the cabin was cold and dark, and, and I'd have to climb out of my warm top bunk. Suddenly, I threw up over the edge of the bed. My dad heard the awful retching noise and splatter and came running in, flicked on the light and surveyed the spreading mess. Couldn't make it to the bathroom, he asked. I'm sorry, Dad, I said, knowing I deserved every angry comment that would follow now. I had done something foolish, messy, embarrassing, and worst of all, childish. But my dad didn't yell. He didn't belittle me or call me names. He just hurriedly left and came back with a mop, a bucket of sudsy hot water, and a scrub brush. I watched, amazed, as he got on hands and knees, wiped up my mess, and began scrubbing each pine board clean again. Years later, when my dad died suddenly, I was reminded of that picture of grace and mercy and service, and I have never forgotten it. Now, I think you know, or at least you should know, that the real heroes and heroines in Jesus' family, that is the church, the real leaders are not necessarily the preachers or the upfront guys and gals. The real heroes are those who lead on, the ha on their hands and on their knees, the ones who serve others. God gets life-stabilizing st confidence done in the lives of others through people like that, through people like you. One last observation, you see it in verses 15 through 17 once again. The delivery of a life-changing, life-challenging word can happen through you. Verse 15, greet the brethren who are, at, uh, who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that's in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So here's what Paul instructs them. Read this letter, then switch with Laodicea and read their letter. That would be the book of Ephesians. And he says, and challenge Archippus not to shrink from the ministry, from what the Lord has given him and has directed him to do. Archippus is the son of Philemon, uh, probably the interim pastor at the church in Colossae. Now, it's interesting, I think. Two important messages, I think, come through these words here. Number one, he says, remember that these letters are serious. Read this one, then get the other one. And read that one too. Then let them read yours. God is speaking to you here in what I'm writing. Paul is saying God is speaking. Understand what's being written and take it in. And secondly, notice that these challenges call for an individual response. I mean, can you imagine when Tychicus got up and, and you know, on that Sunday morning read this letter to the congregation the church at Colossae on that Sunday morning. Can you imagine in that moment the look on Archippus' face? Verse 17, Archippus, get with it, fellow. The Lord has given you a ministry to do. Fulfill it. The time for half effort is over. Now, that's a lesson I bet that he never forgot. But here's a lesson for us too. You see, just reading the letters, hearing God's word is not enough. It never has been. Of course, you know, we know that from familiar passages like James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only. But let me show you another interesting passage that I think makes this very point. You find it in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 21. This is Jesus speaking. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, that's the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Then in the next five verses, he tells the familiar story of the, of the wise and the foolish builders. So skip down then to verse 28. 
When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Scripture says there in verse 29 that Jesus taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers. Now, the teachers of the law in those days were the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the ones that studied uh, the scriptures. They were the ones who wrote the books and the commentaries and the addendums to the scriptures. These were the folks who were effectively the repositories of wisdom. They were the ones who would stand up in the synagogue every Sabbath Saturday and make beautiful speeches and carry on with lengthy dissertations concerning the intricacies of God and, and his wonderful word. But here we read in the word before us that Jesus, Rabbi Jesus comes along and it appears here that Jesus introduces a new way of teaching. And we can tell that it's a new way because the people of the day who, again, were accustomed to hearing the finest scholars and students of the word, they noticed that it was different. They said, this man Jesus teaches with authority, not like our scribes and teachers of the law. So, what does that mean, to teach with authority? Well, I began to look into that a little bit, and I found really essentially three um, interesting perspectives among commentators. First of all, some authors felt that teaching with authority meant that the teacher or, or the educator uh, was one who understands and is somebody who he or she really knows their subject very well. In other words, they've got credentials, uh, they've got degrees and what have you. They're well versed in the subject at hand and familiar with its intricacies and so on. And so when you have that sort of a base of knowledge, that's when you are able to teach with authority. And while that might be part of it, I don't think that's the definitive proof necessarily, of teaching with authority. I mean, sure, it's, it's important to know your subject. It's important to be uh, well-versed in your topic and, and certainly to have expertise in your field. But this has probably been true for you. Over the course of my life, I've known a, a number of people who've had a wealth of knowledge, who've possessed advanced degrees, who were considered experts in their fields, and yet they could not teach a lick. They'd put a glass eye to sleep when they would lecture. They were boring, or they were disorganized, or they were irrelevant. And really, there was effectively no authority at all about their teaching. So just knowing your stuff is important, but it's really not enough. Some other commentators um, that I read said, no, it's not how, how much you know, necessarily, that determines your authority, but it's whether or not you practice what you preach. They say it's when a person lives what they are, they are teaching, when they are uh, leading others by example, when there is no discontinuity between what they say and what they do, that's when a person is teaching with authority. And again, I'd say that's important. That certainly uh, gives your message credibility, but that still doesn't mean you are a teacher with authority. Because, I mean, I'm willing to venture that most of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes of Israel were sincere and scrupulous sorts of, of men. And yet, in spite of their sincerity, the scripture says that they did not teach with authority. And thirdly, others have said, well, sure, knowledge is important and, and sincerity is important. But it's when the teacher is empowered by the Holy Spirit. When he or she has, you know, the anointing of God, that's when they teach with authority. And again, I would say that's important, but, but that's not necessarily the proof. Um, you know, many of God's prophets that we see recorded for us in Scripture spoke with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and yet they were often ignored or ridiculed or rejected. And so while their message was authoritative, their teaching and preaching might not have been. So then, what is it? What is the test? Well, let me submit to you this morning that it may 
involve having a solid base of knowledge and having sincerity and, and indeed being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But what is, what is the most definitive, the ultimate and arbiter of whether or not you are a teacher with authority? I think it's simply this. Do people do what you say? You know, I could have the anointing of God, or you may have the advanced degree, or you may, you know, know your subject inside and out. But if people don't respond, if they don't do what you say, then effectively it means nothing. One of the fundamental laws of teaching states that unless a student has learned, they have not been taught. They may have been instructed, they may have been lectured, they may have been educated, but if they have not truly learned, then they've not truly been taught. And so I think one of the things that you can notice as you read the Gospels is it seems that Jesus was always very careful to ensure that people acted on what he said. If a person would come to him and say, well, Lord, I really like what I hear. I believe what you're saying here. And my plan is, Jesus, to follow you very soon. As soon as I get a couple of other things settled and get some uh, loose ends kind of tied up, Jesus would say, no, that's not an option. When Jesus gave an instruction or a command, he typically required immediate and complete obedience. Why is that? Well, Obviously, it's because it's not by hearing alone that we learn, but by doing that we learn. Spiritual growth does not come by attending meetings and hearing sermons and watching podcasts and and live streams and listening to Bible study. Growth comes by obeying them. And you know, the Lord tells us that His disciples... Those who are truly his followers are those who do what he says. In fact, Jesus uses some pretty strong language to describe the person who comes to church or even watches online uh, faithfully week after week, month after month, year after year, but never experiences consistent, progressive life change. In that passage in Matthew 7 that we referenced but didn't read, verse 26, you see there he calls them a fool, a foolish man, or a foolish woman. It's the Greek word moros, from which we get the English word moron. The Lord's half-brother James goes even further in his analysis. Look again at that passage in James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word, he says, and so deceive yourselves... Do what it says. Now, of course, you and I, I think, um, know and and understand that generally to deceive is bad. Although sometimes when you deceive someone else, you might be perceived to be clever or, or witty or cunning or whatever. But when you deceive yourself, well, that's just plain stupid. It's moronic. There was a classic study uh, done a number of years ago by some behavioral psychologists who studied a sample population of individuals who attended worship services on a regular basis. Uh, This was probably way before pre-COVID days. And what they found was that the average person can retain only about 20% of the content that they hear in any given sermon. And the study showed that you will still retain that 20% for up to 10 days if you don't hear another sermon in the intervening time. But they found that as soon as you hear another sermon, it helps you forget the first one and your retention rate drops off dramatically. Now, that's true of a sermon, a lecture, a Sunday school lesson, what have you. And frankly, that is a shame because, you know, we're not here just to be going through the motions. We're not playing games. We are involved in serious business as a church. But the reality is, after 10 days have passed, we lose the majority of the content of any given sermon or lesson. Why? Well, because we haven't learned it. We haven't interpreted it into our lives. We haven't made application. We don't practice it. 
You and I only tend to retain what we integrate. And that, in a sense, is what our Lord is saying in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. If you don't act upon what you hear, if you don't do what it is that you hear preached from the Word of God, then the sermon is effectively a great big waste of your time. So, how did Jesus teach? What was different about the way that Jesus Christ taught in as much as they said he taught with authority? Well, for one thing, Jesus um, didn't typically teach through sermons and speeches. Now, we do, of course, have a few of them recorded in Scripture, but the vast majority of his teaching over the course of those three years with his buddies was much more personalized. The way that Jesus generally taught was through giving people instruction to do concrete sorts of things. For instance, he would gather his disciples around him and he would say, Peter, James, John, Andrew, uh, guys, I want you to go to such and such a village. And when you get there, I want you to look for a specific household. And while you're there, I want you to tell them about the kingdom of God. I want you to heal the sick. Uh, I don't want you to charge anything for your services. He said, you're not to go to the villages of the Samaritans at this time. He said, if you're not welcomed in any particular town, shake the dust of that town off your feet and move on. Then I want you to come back and report back to me what you did and what happened. Now, how did the disciples uh, respond to that kind of instruction? Do you think they sat there at his feet and listened to him and then they, they would get up and uh, they would shake his hand as they went out the door and say, Jesus... Thank you for that inspiring message today. That was an excellent speech, Jesus. I really appreciated it. We'll see you next Sabbath for another installment in this series. And then they'd walk away without any life change or follow through. No, Jesus spoke and he expected them to do it. He taught primarily through instruction to do concrete sorts of things. Go here, do this, don't do that. Come back here and report to me. And then when they did come back, Jesus would adjust what was wrong and then he would send them out to do it again. They'd come back and say, Jesus, Jesus, even the, even the demons and the spirits listen to us and obey our voices. It's so cool. And Jesus would say, look, guys, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice, rather, that your names are written in the book of life. Get your priorities straight. And on another occasion, they came back and said, Lord, Lord, the the people in such and such a town didn't listen to us, and they rejected our message. Can we call fire down from heaven to consume them? And Jesus would say, no. Look, I come with a spirit of salvation, not a spirit of destruction. Come on, think about who you're representing here. You see, the disciples learned, and they learned fast because they learned as they were doing it. They learned by personal experience. He would send them out with a certain amount of teaching, and they came back having learned it because they lived it. Remember, Jesus said, Go you therefore and make disciples. He didn't say, go you therefore and make speeches. The scripture doesn't say how beautiful are the mouths of those who bring the good news, does it? Isaiah 52, Romans 10 say, how beautiful are the feet of those who share the gospel. It's about doing and going and being. Until you've done the word of God, you have not learned it. And so, as Paul wraps up the book of Colossians, he's challenging these churches to take these letters very seriously. Challenging uh, Archippus to get off his blessed assurance and get back into usefulness for God. The point of these verses, of this strong finish, is very clear. When life-shaping encouragement is needed, how does that happen? When life-stabilizing confidence needs to enter into another person's life, how does God get that done? When someone needs to face up to being what God has called them and equipped them to be, how does that challenge get fleshed out in someone's life? 
It typically happens through you and me with each other. A word of encouragement, time on our knees, honestly applying the word of God. Would you pray with me and then we're going to close our service this morning with Eric Sheets who's going to come and minister to us in song. Father, thank you for uh, these words, once again, from your scripture. We thank you for the book of Colossians, Father. There is so much truth contained in these brief four chapters, and yet we haven't learned it, Lord, until we do it. And so I pray that you would help us to be doers, to read these words, to understand the truth that's there, and then to press them into our living and flesh them out in our relationships with others in this world. We ask in Jesus' name. Hun
hundred billion failures disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it here If you left the grave behind you so will I I can see your heart and everything you've done Every part designed in a work of art called love If you gladly chose surrender so will I You can see your heart a billion different ways Every precious one and child you died to save if you gave your life to love them, so will I Like you would again a hundred billion times But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you all for coming this morning. We're so glad you're here. And we're going to be dismissed now. Would you stand? Father, thank you again for the day you've given us to come together and fellowship and worship you in spirit and truth and song. And so we uh, ask for your blessing as we leave and keep us safe until we come back and gather again next week. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You're dismissed.